thank you sir so it's 8 pm here and uh, uh, i welcome you and we are going to start uh, i i welcome to all my uh, dear participants and as well as uh, our today's speaker uh, who is dr sridhar kalyanam sundaram and uh, today we are going to start our another webinar session on the conjugate hyperbilirubinemia and its approach uh, by our speaker, Dr. Saridhar Kalyanam Sundaram. Uh, uh, Sir is a consultant neurologist and head of department uh, at the Nar Al Imarat Hospital Abu Dhabi. And uh, he's completed his basic medical education uh, from India in 1995. He's the best outgoing student from the Stanley Medical College, Chennai. Uh, Sir qualified in pediatric and neurology in India, he completed the MRCBCH UK and obtained entry into the General Medical Council Specialist registered in the UK in 2005. Uh, Dr. Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram obtained his fellowship of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health uh, UK in 2006, and he worked as a specialist registrar in neontology at Edinburgh's NHS Trust Hospital, Cambridge, uh, UK from 2004 to 2005. From mid 2005 till August 2000, Trial, uh, sir worked as a consultant neurologist in level three neonatal unit at Vishav General Hospital near Glasgow, UK. Following which he moved to the American Hospital, Dubai. He worked uh, there as a consultant neurologist and head of department till 2017. Followed by Zuleika Hospital and Alzheimer Hospital, Dubai. Since May 2021, he is head of neonatology at the Nath Al Imarat Hospital, Abu Dhabi. And he is also examined for MRCBCH clinical examination since 2010 and is an RP instructor as well. And his special interest uh, includes neurodevelopment and respiratory support in units and in neonatal skin care and has many uh, review publications as well. And he has organized and chaired the scientific committee of the many international conferences. And he has also our own YouTube channel for education purpose. Uh, previously, it was close to 10,000 subscribers, but uh, yesterday uh, it was uh, 15,000 uh, subscribers. So, uh, congratulations, sir. Uh, so, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can see me and uh, you can hear, you can see yes. the slides. Yes, sir. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I know. I get a lot of love from Pakistan and uh, all the colleagues there. I mean, and obviously in UAE, we work together. Uh, it's amazing to be in a meeting to speak to all of you. Dr. Junaid here is a very good friend and Dr. Ihan, we worked together in American hospital long ago. So uh, I listened to Dr. Khalid Haq last week, an excellent lecture, and I'm happy that he's here today as well. So uh, good evening, Dr. Khalid. And uh, I'll just start the presentation, just to say that obviously I'm not an expert in the topic, but I'll try to present it in a way that is useful to all of you. I know it's a bit of theory as well in it uh, because you need to cover uh, the topic as best as we can. We will try to make it interesting and I'll try to finish by 45 minutes after which we'll have some discussion. So we all know that uh, jaundice in itself is very common. 60% of term babies and nearly 80% of premature babies uh, have jaundice. In majority, it resolves by two weeks, but in about two to 15% of newborns, depends on which population you're looking at, jaundice can be observed even at two weeks. Jaundice persisting beyond two weeks in the term formula fed babies and over three weeks in premature babies and in term breastfed babies is called prolonged jaundice. So this improvement for the breastfed babies is to avoid over screening. Just a quick recap, I mean, you're all familiar with bilirubin metabolism. So the uh, red blood cells are broken down in the reticular endothelial system. The heme mainly comes from that and we also get other sources of heme from uh, heme protein, myoglobin and other heme containing proteins. So this uh, is acted on by heme oxygenase to bilirubin and bilirubin reductase to bilirubin. Bilirubin mainly binds with the serum albumin it passes by the liver where it is taken up by the liver cells using the ligand in protein. And in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocytes, it undergoes conjugation uh, with glucuronyl transferase and the bilirubin glucuronide is excreted in the bile. This uh, partly gets uh, broken down uh, through beta glucuronidase and reabsorbs through the enterohepatic, but most of it comes through 
in the bile. Conjugated bilirubin doesn't enter directly into the bloodstream unless there is a problem in the liver. And uh, if there is no conjugated bilirubin, the urine is acolic or uh, clear. Well, if there is conjugated bilirubin, so urine gets dark yellow. So if you have an yellow urine with pale stools, it's very typical of conjugated jaundice. We know that bile secretion is an essential function of the liver. The bile acids are delivered to the intestine and its role in lipid sol solubilization and absorption is important. In addition to the bile acids, we also have metabolic products like cholesterol, bilirubin, which we just discussed, the porphyrins and xenobiotics, which are chemicals which are present in the body, which doesn't belong to the body, they are excreted as well in the bile. So you know that the liver is one of the uh, metabolic systems as well as excretory system in addition to the kidneys. The bile acids themselves are formed via multiple complex steps uh, in the degradation of cholesterol. The main bile acids secreted in the liver are cholic acid and quinodeoxycholic acid. We all know that arsodeoxycholic acid is also used to treat uh, as a cholinergic agent and also to uh, replace bile acids. Extensive conjugation with primarily glycine and taurine occurs in the bile acids as well within the hepatocyte. The bile flow can be divided into bile acid dependent and bile acid independent flow. So we call the bile acid dependent as cholinergic flow and any uh, medicine with a function which stimulates the bile secretion is cholinergic. So uh, the primary force comes from the bile acid dependent pathway. This is a quick uh, recap. I mean, this is the liver architecture and this is the segment that we are zooming in on. So we have the hepatocytes, we have the bile canaliculi and you have the tight junction between the two. And sometimes you have uh, problems in the tight junction protein, which may lead to bile acid release uh, defects. We also have uh, problems in the bile acid interchange mechanism through the bile canaliculi, which is uh, related to the uh, familial progressive uh, disorders. And we have uh, the sinusoid, the secretions go into that. Subsequently, uh, you can see the architecture of the liver as well. So we have the central uh, hep central vein at the center of the hepatic lobule. We have the hepatocytes radiating out. And at the outer part, you get the portal triad. So we have the uh, portal vein, portal artery, and the portal uh, the bile duct in the portal triad. In this, obviously, there is no fibrosis, but in the abnormalities, which we will discuss later, we will start getting fibrosis as well. So this is just to introduce you to the basic anatomy of the liver. It's helpful to understand also that direct and conjugated bilirubin are actually different. They don't mean exactly the same. And it depends on the direct reaction before addition of an accelerating agent. So the common test is the diazo or the Vandenberg method. And this doesn't specifically measure the conjugated bilirubin, but it reacts, uh, measures the direct bilirubin, which reacts with the reagent before an uh, accelerating agent is added. So the direct bilirubin can in, includes conjugated bilirubin and delta bilirubin. And because of this factor, the direct bilirubin often goes up when the total bilirubin goes up suddenly. So you are screening a baby with jaundice around day three, day four, you see a sudden rise in the to total bilirubin to 20, for example, from 15. And then the direct bilirubin goes up from one to three suddenly. But the next day, if you repeat, the direct bilirubin starts coming down. And that is because when the bilirubin goes up acutely, the fraction that is unbound to albumin, the delta bilirubin goes up as well. So that is why hemolytic jaundice, for example, has a very high risk of uh, brain damage. If it's going up too rapidly, it overcomes and the delta or free bilirubin is high. Direct bilirubin concentrations are higher and more variable than the conjugated bilirubin. And so you can say that conjugated bilirubin is more accurate, but it depends on what lab uh, test your lab is doing. So if we are specifically measuring conjugated bilirubin, well and good. But if they are doing the direct bilirubin, we accept uh, that as well and accordingly work on it. So jaundice is clinically evident when the total serum bilirubin exceeds 2.5 to 3 milligrams. So below 3 milligrams, you would not pick up jaundice. And this is the criteria for which we screen the babies at prolonged jaundice review. I told that uh, for breastfed or preterm babies who still jaundiced at three weeks, if they're visibly jaundiced, that is if the level exceeds, or you do a transcutaneous bilirubin and it is above this cutoff, that is when you consider uh, doing the total and direct bilirubin tractions. Uh, so that you can identify pathologic cholestasis at the earliest possible. So you must have seen the recent uh, AAP guideline update for neonatal jaundice. In that, the comment 
made about direct bilirubinous, the using the North American and European uh, Society for Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. They define a direct serum bilirubin more than one milligram per cent of normal. If they're using conjugated bilirubin, they use a level of more than 0 0.3 milligrams per deciliter. The positive predictive value for biliary atresia and other causes of pathology cholestasis can be greatly improved if you repeat the measurement within a few days to two weeks. So you're picking them up at two weeks, then it's okay to repeat it after a week or so to see the trend if it is borderline, uh, but you don't want to miss it beyond three to four weeks because earlier the diagnosis is made, the quicker you can initiate the pathway to treat. An increase in the direct or conjugated bilirubin concentration suggests the possibility of pathology cholestasis. And here again, uh, the previous uh, uh, possibility of direct bilirubin more than 20% of the total is no longer regarded as necessary because by the time you see these babies, I think uh, someone is not muted. Can you mute yourself? So direct bilirubin concentration of more than 20% of the total is no longer regarded as necessary for the diagnosis of cholestasis. It's also important to consider other causes uh, that can be treated apart from the biliary atresia. So urinary tract infection, isoimmune hemolytic disease, sepsis, and some involuntary. So we will be discussing in the following slides our basic approach, and then we will deal with each one of these conditions as far as possible. So in my practice, as well as the recommendation from the other guidelines, it's a good practice to include conjugated or direct fraction of bilirubin at initial assessment. So the first time you do a blood test for jaundice for whatever reason, include the conjugated fraction in it. At least you'll have a baseline. And as I will discuss later, there are studies which show that uh, the direct bilirubin fraction is slightly high in the babies who are picked up later having abnormality. And once a baby is reviewed at two weeks or at the first opportunity around that stage, it's ideal to do uh, if the persisting jaundice is there. If it is a breastfeeding baby, we could wait another week to three weeks. But if you are worried about a missed opportunity, you can as well do it at two weeks. It's not going to change. If the trend is increasing, you would pick it up at that stage. So it's not hard and fast that you should wait till three weeks in a uh, breastfed baby. You can do it at two weeks for any of these categories. And the later you do and you prove that there is no conjugated fraction, the safer you are. So you also review the newborn screening results. We have hypothyroidism, galactosemia, tyrosinemia, and cystic fibrosis often included in the newborn screen. It depends on where you practice and what tests are included. So be clear about what is included in your panel. And if a baby has suspected abnormality, the regional labs, for example, in uh, Abu Dhabi, we have Tawam Hospital in Alain, where we can send for the extended newborn screen and they can report in within 24 hours in such cases. We should be clear about differentiation of categories of benign jaundice because <clears throat> most of the babies with prolonged jaundice have this benign jaundice. So we have physiologic jaundice, which we are clear that it starts by 24 to 36 hours. It peaks by three to four days and the peak is around five to 12 milligrams. And by, uh, it, by one to two weeks, most of them go below three milligrams per cent unless there is breastfeeding jaundice. So physiologic jaundice can progress to either of these two. So breastfeeding jaundice is aggravated physiologic jaundice in breastfeeding babies, usually due to reduced milk output, uh, the time it takes for the lactogenesis. The peaks uh, by two to four days and the peak bilirubin, uh, the onset is two to four days, similar to physiologic jaundice peak by three to six days. The peak is a little higher, it can be exaggerated and some of these babies may need treatment. Of course, you need to attend to the feeding sufficiency as well. And uh, these babies usually have a component of uh, breast milk jaundice in some of them because these are mainly breastfed babies and the jaundice may persist uh, more than three weeks. In uh, incidence is 12 to 13%. Of course, uh, breast milk jaundice is due to the beta glucuronidase, which is secreted in the milk of some of the mothers. So it's fairly not very common, but not uncommon as well. So two to 4% of the babies will have breast milk jaundice and here, Actually, you have a level more than 10 milligrams persisting for a few weeks. So I've seen babies where the bilirubin is like 12, 13 milligram, even at two to three months of age. And all that we do is monitor the bilirubin on a regular basis. There is no indication in any of these conditions to supplement with formula or to disrupt breastfeeding unless you are needing, uh, you are approaching a level close to exchange transfusion. Of course, you can treat with phototherapy if it crosses the phototherapy range for that age of the baby, but you don't need to disrupt breastfeeding. And if you do have to pause breastfeeding for a couple of days, if they're approaching exchange, you can uh, reassure the mother and encourage her to express the milk. 
This is what we discussed. So breastfeeding jaundice is due to the uh, delayed letdown and reduced calorie intake and relative dehydration. There may be decreased fluid intake and delayed passage of meconium associated. And this is the so showing the area where the beta glucuronidase acts. If the beta glucuronidase comes in from the milk, it releases the bilirubin from the conjugated bilirubin in the gut and it can enter the enterohepatic circulation and keeps persisting. It doesn't come out as much in the stool. So here, the only thing we need to do is optimal breastfeeding support from antenatal and immediate postnatal period. And we need to monitor closely for the breast milk jaundice, but don't stop breastfeeding. And of course, if they fill the criteria, fulfill the criteria, you should <clears throat> in babies with persistent or prolonged jaundice. The incidence of neonatal cholestasis is one in 2,500 in approximate numbers. Cholestasis is defined as a reduced bile formation or flow resulting in the retention of biliary substances within the liver. And it can be related to a defect in the intrahepatic production or the transmembrane transport of bile, or it can be a mechanical obstruction preventing the bile flow. The third component, the obstruction component is the most important to pick up early and uh, because biliary atresia is the commonest reason for this obstruction. As the bile is not excreted in the stool, we get acolic or pale stools and obstructive or cholestatic jaundice. The kidneys do not filter unconjugated bilirubin because it fits avid binding to the albumin and the presence of bilirubin in the urine, as I discussed earlier, indicates the presence of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So a dark urine uh, in the absence of dehydration, obviously you have to think and it stains the nappy typically, the bilirubin will be seen on the nappy. So you can ask these questions to the mother while eliciting the history. And I mentioned that it's very important to diagnose biliary atresia early because surgical intervention before two months correlates with a better long-term outcome. Despite the best of efforts in many countries, even in the developed world, the average age of diagnosis and treatment is around 60 days. So the causes, this is not exhaustive. Obviously, we can classify as intrahepatic and extrahepatic. Extrahepatic is uh, classified mainly by biliary atresia. Then you have the other minor conditions like mucus plugging, polydocal cyst and Caroli's disease. Uh, intrahepatic, allegal syndrome, and the metabolic conditions we'll discuss later as well, and these infections may contribute. So biliary atresia represents the most common cause. Of course, these charts would be different from what is given in most of the textbooks because as time evolves, uh, the diagnosis of the more important, rarer conditions has started increasing. So biliary atresia is in 35 to 41%. So this would be the range 25 to 40% in the olden days as well. However, we have the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis or PFIC, which is seen in 10% now, which was in the idiopathic category previously. In the past 20 years, our knowledge of this condition and the ability to do genetic analysis to diagnose this has improved. And we will be discussing this later on. Preterm birth, related, mostly TP and related cholestasis is seen in 10%. Luckily, most of these are benign. Metabolic and endocrine conditions like hypothyroidism and uh, hypoadrenalism or panhypopetrism can contribute in 9 to 17 percent. Allegal syndrome in 2 to 6 percent. Infections in 1 to 10. Mitochondriopathies. Biliary sludge can happen where you have hemolytic diseases. It can be hemolytic anemias in the family like sickle cell, uh, or it can be uh, sepsis related hemolysis. You have idiopathic causes still in 13 to 30 percent. Remember that. About 20 years ago, this was around 40-45%. So this has come down significantly because we are categorizing some of the metabolic conditions better. So this is the guideline which uh, I mentioned earlier in relation to the AAP jaundice update. And this is a joint recommendation from the North American Society and the European Society for Pediatric Gastrohepatology and Nutrition. And uh, you have the full text available on the web as well. So there are main parameters that are covered in the history taking. So we have family history, mainly consanguinity and history of neonatal cholestasis in the parents or siblings, which are related to all these autosomal recessive disorders, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin, PFIC, and uh, allegal syndrome can also be inherited. If there is a history of repeated fetal loss or early demise, you have to consider gestational alloimmune liver disease. So this is like alloimmune hematological conditions, but here the Alloimmunity is to the liver uh, material itself. The main feature here is a very high risk of uh, coagulopathy in the newborn. They often lead to death. Spherocytosis and other hemolytic diseases, I mentioned the risk of biliary sludging, and they can aggravate conjugated hyperbilirubinemia through that. 
when you look at the prenatal history, the prenatal ultrasound findings may sometimes pick up choridocal cyst. And if there are bowel anomalies or other syndromes, you may pick them up. And cholestasis of pregnancy can often be seen in carriers of the PFIC gene. So if they are heterozygotes, they might sometimes have cholestasis. So you may have to correlate that if the mother's history is suggested. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy is known to be associated with the heterozygote condition for three hydroxy acyl coa dehydrogenase deficiency. And maternal infections, as we always ask for torch infections. Uh, in terms of the infant history, we have the gestational age, prematurity we discussed as well. It's more for gestational age, babies have a higher risk of syndromes and intrauterine right infections. And we have other conditions which may contribute autoimmune hemolysis, G6PD deficiency, hydroxyphetalis, which all contribute to increased risk of cholestasis, same as the hemolytic conditions, anemia we discussed. Neonatal infections, urinary tract infections, sepsis, and CMV, HIV, syphilis may also contribute. I told you that you should review the result of the newborn screen because we can pick up kaleptosemia, uh, pan hypopituitarism, fatty acid oxidation defects, and cystic fibrosis, also hypothyroidism. And the nutrition source, if it is breastfeeding babies, kaleptosemia has to be considered. Uh, formula fed the same way, any lactose containing milk. And if there has been fruit juices introduced, uh, you should consider hereditary fructose intolerance. I've seen one baby. In a family, repeatedly, the child used to worsen after three to four months when they started introducing sugarcane juice or other uh, juices into the family. In, those, in that family, they were introducing early. And with this history, the child used to develop uh, severe uh, liver failure by six to eight months and die. And this was the fourth sibling that we saw. Luckily, we were able to identify and uh, manage that baby. And you have parental nutrition-associated liver disease. Of course, there are other conditions which you can review. Growth is associated with genetic metabolic, hearing problems, PFIC can be having, or the tight junction protein uh, mutation. Vomiting can suggest bowel obstruction, pyloric stenosis. The level of stooling and the color of the stool is important and urine characteristics. Excessive bleeding may indicate coagulopathy and the associated vitamin K deficiency with liver failure. And uh, irritability lethargy is not typically seen in biliary atresia, but it may suggest metabolic disease or sepsis. If there is a history of previous abdominal surgery, NEC and TPN related can contribute and also intestinal atresia may be associated with bile duct atresia, polagiopathies. In terms of physical findings, the general health ill appearance may indicate infection or metabolic disease and typically infants with biliary atresia are deceptively normal. So this is very important. Remember that the biliary atresia babies don't look unwell. So you may easily miss them unless you are really looking for the prolonged jaundice. So uh, in terms of general appearance, we have dysmorphic features in Allegil syndrome. Remember that you may not pick that up in the newborn period. The typical dysmorphism, uh, the broad nasal bridge, triangular face, deep set eyes and sharp chin, they develop around six months of age. In terms of the vision examination and hearing assessment, you have congenital infection, septoptic dysplasia, and you can get posterior embryotoxone in the uh, Allegil syndrome and cataracts as well in intrauterine infections. Cardiac examination can be a feature of Allegil syndrome. You also get uh, polysplenia and situs malformations in some uh, specific type syndromic types of biliary atresia. In terms of abdominal examination, you look for hepatosplenomegaly and abdominal masses and umbilical hernia may suggest uh, hypothyroidism, for example, or metabolic conditions. The stool examination is crucial and it's better that you don't go by the parent's description. You try to look at the stool itself to see the color of the stool. We'll be looking at the stool chart as well next uh, in the coming slides. And of course, in neurologic assessment, you look at the overall vigor and tone because hypothyroid babies or babies with metabolic conditions can have altered tone. So in terms of approach to investigations, we have a targeted approach. So you have tier one investigations, which you would do in any baby with cholestasis and the tier two investigations, which you do in liaison with the gastroenterologist in select cases. So uh, the tier one investigations we aim to evaluate after cholestasis has been established in order to identify the treatable disorder as well as to define how severe it is. The urgency of the treatment will depend on that. So you perform blood tests, including the blood count and differential, the clotting profile, AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, gamma, GT, total and direct bilirubin. So the full liver function panel, Albumin and glucose are done as well. So glucose is important for galactosemia testing. 
it's a good practice to check the alpha 1 antitrypsin phenotype at this stage if you can, if you can afford it, because it will help to differentiate from other causes of obstruction. Because uh, on the biopsy, for example, it mimics biliary atresia. Of course, the thyroid and the newborn screen results. In terms of urine, you would do the urine analysis and culture, as well as reducing substances to rule out galactosemia. And consider cultures of the blood, urine, and other fluids if the infant is clinically unwell. You verify the results of treatable disorders from the newborn screen. We also obtain the fasting ultrasound as part of the tier one investigation. Once you confirm that the conjugated bilirubin is abnormal, we'll be looking at the ultrasound findings in the further slides. The tier two, as I said, involve the gastroenterologist and hepatologist if you have not identified the cause in the tier one investigations. So again, you have the general test, which you might have already reviewed the thyroid function. You also include the serum bile acids cortisol as well. And specific etiologies, you do metabolic panel, serum ammonia, lactate, cholesterol, red blood cell, uh, galliput for the galactosemia, urine succinyl acetone for the tyrosinemia and organic acids. And bile salt species testing is important for specific bile salt related disorders. For infectious disease, you can do PCR for CMB, herpes, hysteria as well. And uh, genetics, you discuss in liaison with the gastroenterologist, and you can consider the gene panel for many of the recent metabolic disorders, including the progressive of uh, the PFIC conditions. And of course, sweat chloride for uh, cystic fibrosis. Imaging, in addition to the ultrasound, which was done as part of the tier one investigation, you do the chest X-ray for looking at lung and heart disease associated syndromes. Butterfly vertebra can suggest allegal syndrome. Echocardiogram, there are heart diseases seen in allegal syndrome, pulmonary stenosis, BSD can be seen, ASD can be seen, and cholangiogram can be considered, which we will discuss as well. Liver biopsy is a differentiation of choice for the intrahepatic and extrahepatic uh, disease. Once you consider extrahepatic disease or obstruction, uh, the intraoperative cholangiogram is the mainstay of uh, investigation. And you might need consultations depending on what you find in the above, ophthalmology, metabolic and genetic, cardiology, pediatric surgeon, and nutritional dietitian. In terms of the ultrasound, you need an expert operator who is uh, clear about what they are looking for so you don't miss findings. And uh, you look for the liver structure and size, presence of dilated bile ducts or obstructed bile ducts, gallbladder size, wall thickness, and presence of the triangular cord sign, which I'll discuss next. Identification of the extrahepatic obstructive lesions like cholidocal cyst, gallstone, sludge, ascites, spleen size, situs abnormalities, and vascular malformations to look for the syndromic type of biliary atresia. And of course, it's very important. Sometimes the bubble gas interferes with the nature of your study. So if it is difficult to pick up, you can. And usually it's a fasting ultrasound done uh, so that you pick up the gallbladder. Uh, after feed, the gallbladder empties, so it's not conclusive. Remember that picking up a small gallbladder is a finding. You see in biliary atresia. So the triangular cord sign, abnormal gallbladder morphology, lack of gallbladder contraction after feeding, that means it's uh, fibrosed. Non-visualization of the common bile duct, hepatic artery diameter, the ratio of the hepatic artery diameter to the portal vein, subcapsular blood flow. They, they have all been suggested to aid, but not uh, none of them can singularly confirm the diagnosis. You cannot just say because the sign is there, it's biliary atresia, but it increases your index of suspicion. And most infants with biliary atresia have a small undetectable gallbladder. So that's why the fasting scan is very important. If you're suspecting pan hypopituitarism because of the risk of the sugar dropping, you wouldn't uh, make the infants fast too long. In addition, findings such as heterotaxy, midline liver, polysplenia, asplenia, pre-duodenal portal vein, they increase the concern of biliary atresia with malformation. And uh, normal ultrasound does not rule out non-syndromic biliary atresia. So this is the triangular cord sign, more than or equal to four millimeter thickness of the echogenic anterior wall of the right portal vein. So the echogenic anterior wall of the right portal vein, and it's a triangular tubular area of echogenic fibrous tissue in the porta hepatis. So this triangular area of tissue is a triangular cord sign and it falls on the anterior margin of the right portal vein, anterior wall. The scintigraphy we used to study a lot about it, but most people have started moving away from it for the reasons we'll describe here. 
So it has been used to confirm biliary tract patency, but it is limited by its low specificity. The range is 68 to 72%. And a non-diagnostic result in the bile flow is limited uh, as a result of other variable etiologies. So patients who have the interlobular uh, bile duct paucity, idiopathic neonatal hepatitis, those on TPN may all have non-excreting scans. So that's why the specificity is very low. And obviously, uh, sometimes we used to give phenobarbital for five days and wait, and all this delays the actual diagnosis. And that's why they are moving away from the HIDAS scans, a lack of specificity and a possible delay from the uh, need for simulation and so on. Yang et al. had published a study looking at the different modalities to help differentiate uh, obstructive and non-obstructive uh, giant cell hepatitis. 69 infants were studied and they underwent, all of them underwent these tests. The uh, hepatobiliary scintigraphy had a sensitivity of 88%, but specificity was 45%. And it adds little to the routine evaluation and it may help to rule out obstruction. So if there is a negative flow, it is highly sensitive, but your specificity is less, so you can't be sure it's biliary atresia. And they found that liver biopsy had the highest sensitivity in detecting biliary atresia and differentiating it from intrahepatic uh, bile duct disorders like Allegil syndrome. It was quite uh, high specificity and sensitivity. You have non-invasive modes of assessing like uh, MRCP and ERCP, of course, is not invasive, not specifically non-invasive, but it's less invasive. The problem with ERCP is the lack of suitable uh, infant scope and you need an expert and it needs anesthesia. Magnetic resonance uh, cholangiopancreography is non-invasive and you can visualize the biliary system, including the first order branches of the intrahepatic bile duct. So if it is biliary atresia, you may be able to classify it based on the MRCP. It has a high sensitivity, but again, it's a low specificity. And we also have, if you're doing a liver biopsy, some centers may consider percutaneous transhepatic cholecystocholangiography, but most of them don't do it because the same information is often obtained by the liver biopsy result, and you don't get much additional findings. And of course, it's more invasive. As I said earlier, liver biopsy is the cornerstone of the diagnostic workup. It's very important that an experienced pathologist looks at it and the sensitivity is quite high in these cases as well as specificity. There are some disorders that mimic biliary atresia histologically, and these include the parental nutrition associated cholestasis. So if it is a premature baby, you need to have an extra index of suspicion because the biopsy may overlap with biliary atresia and you need to uh, do the intraoperative cholangiography if you're worried. Cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin may all be associated with a similar biopsy picture. The earliest histologic changes of biliary atresia are relatively non-specific and biopsies which are performed too early in the course may result in a falsely negative diagnosis. So again, just like a normal ultrasound doesn't rule out, a normal liver biopsy also doesn't rule out, and you need to continue to watch these babies and have a low threshold to go for intraoperative cholangiography if in doubt. So the liver biopsy, as you know, is often challenging to perform. It needs an expert review. The tissue has to be properly saved and taken to the lab. Sometimes you do the biopsy and the way you are transporting it, you may lose it. And in some inconclusive cases, a repeat liver biopsy a few months later may help as conditions evolve. Of course, this will not apply to biliary atresia. If there is a concern, you would intervene early. And uh, as these babies have insufficient hepatic synthetic function, you may have to give vitamin K in a higher dose initially before you do the biopsy, or you have to test the cholangi because there's a risk of bleeding in 4% of the babies after liver biopsy. So these are slides from patients with uh, biliary atresia. And you can see very well that the normal sinusoidal pattern is preserved, but you can see fibrosis in the portal tracts. The bile ducts are exaggerated and they are blocked. Uh, so you have features of bile duct obstruction, bile duct proliferation. So you can see multiple bile ducts in the same field, bile plugs obstructing the bile ducts, and you have perilobular fibrosis and edema. Sometimes you get infiltrates of cells. Remember that giant cells are not specific uh, for giant cell or idiopathic hepatitis. There are 20 to 50% of babies with biliary atresia. Some of them may have uh, giant cells as well. And this is what you get with uh, idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. And this picture is not specific as we see giant cell hepatitis pattern is seen in quite a few metabolic and uh, infectious conditions as well. So here you have lost the sinusoidal pattern. You have inflammatory infiltrate and the giant cells. 
we discussed earlier about intraoperative cholangiogram and histological examination of the duct remnant at the time of the surgery. You may do a frozen section of that. So this is the criterion standard to diagnose biliary atresia. This is the only test that can clearly rule out the condition or confirm. Unfortunately, it is invasive and that may be the only option you have. And that's why we don't do the HEDA scan. The liver biopsy is not able to be done also. You still have to go for this if the suspicion is strong. So cases which have a hypoplastic biliary tree, like allegal syndrome and cystic fibrosis, can be confounding in up to 20% of the cases. So it's important that you rule out these two conditions before you actually take the patient to the OT. And uh, intraoperative cholangiogram is typically performed after biliary obstruction is suggested in a liver biopsy, or if there are other clinical conditions, then direct referral to the surgeon can be done. And of course, you go prepared, you get the consent and you explain to the family that if biliary atresia is confirmed, you would do the Kasai procedure on the table. So there are very few exceptions to this because you don't want to expose the patient to anesthesia again and you don't want to delay further. So if you are doing intraoperative cholangiogram, you go prepared to do the Kasai if you confirm the diagnosis. So there may be a slight repetition just for the sake of covering the aspect specific to the conditions now. So biliary atresia is the most frequent and severe cause of uh, neonatal cholestasis. And biliary atresia is basically an ascending inflammatory process of the biliary tree, leading to progressive obliterative scarring of the extrahepatic and intrahepatic bile ducts. And this leads eventually to biliary cirrhosis. So most of these babies uh, die by three to four years untreated. Only early surgical treatment can stall the biliary cirrhosis and that's where rapid identification is important. The exact etiopathogenesis is unknown. Environmental factors, infection, and genetic factors may play a role. It can be related to alloimmune events expedited by microchimerism in the mother. And there are infections like CMVDO virus, which are shown. And some people hypothesize that sclerosing cholangitis or sclerosing uh, diseases are a spectrum with biliary atresia. So some of them develop the severe type, some of them develop it later. The fact that the conjugated bilirubin can be raised in the first bilirubin screening in such babies indicates that the onset of the problem may be antenatal in many of them. So infants present with conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, as we said, uh, depigmented or pale stool, colored urine, and your investigation would show conjugated jaundice, elevated liver transaminase, including GGT. Abdominal ultrasound performed early will show you the features uh, which we discussed. Uh, the triangular periportal sign is fairly sensitive and specific if you do with an expert. And uh, pre- and postprandial ultrasonography facilitates the gallbladder contraction as well or the absence of it. Uh, obstructive conditions like cholidocal cyst, Caroli's disease, gallstone, or inspissated bile or biliary cast can be seen on ultrasound as well. The diagnostic gold standard is percutaneous liver biopsy followed by intraoperative cholangiogram if it is inconclusive or you need to go in for the surgery. And liver biopsy leads to the diagnosis in 80 to 95% of the cases. Histology we discussed already and you see inflammatory infiltrates around the bile duct, portal tract fibrosis, accumulation of the bile with bile plugs and bile duct proliferation. ERCP may serve as a reliable and safe diagnostic tool, but again, technical difficulties will be there. And this HIDA scan is associated with high sensitivity but lack specificity, so it's not often done. So the incidence is 1 in 8,000 live births, and in US, for example, it's 400 cases per year. It's the most frequent indication for liver transplantation in children. And we have three different types, the isolated type, which is 80% of cases, they have a jaundice-free interval after birth, and so you may not pick them up. The syndromic forms may be associated with polysplenia or situs inverses, and these babies are frequently jaundiced, and the initial test itself may show a raised uh, conjugated bilirubin. And you have the cystic form in 5%. The etiology, as we discussed, is not clear. Viruses may contribute toxins, immune systems. And Kasai procedure is crucial before uh, four months, so diagnosed before two months. Uh, between 45 and 90 days, the prognosis gets worse as you delay. And if you don't treat it, cirrhosis develops by six months. And as I said, early death is common. These are the three types pathologically. So we have the type 1 in 5%, type 2 in 2%. Type 1 has a gallbladder which contains bile. And we often have the common bile duct, but the intrahepatic uh, ducts are not developed. And in type 2, we have a visible uh, Patent ductus at the porta, but beyond that, it is atritic 
and the gallbladder is atritic as well. And the commonest type is a type 3, where uh, very fine intrahepatic uh, ducts are seen, but apart from that, nothing else. So this is a type where you do the uh, entrostomy and hope that it works, but it may not work in many of these babies as well. The reason we do it early for the treatment is because it can be a progressive condition and in the early stages, the response is better. So the hepatoportoentrostomy to enable the biliary drainage is the first line of the treatment. The success rate is closely associated with the age at the time of the surgery. If it is performed within the first 60 days, 70% of the babies will establish bile flow. After 90 days, less than 25%. And so if the bile flow is not established, the progress to cirrhosis will continue unless you do a liver transplantation. And by uh, native liver, we mean the number of babies without the liver transplantation. So if uh, surgery is done within the first two months and it's not been still achieved, and you can monitor the success by normalization of conjugated bilirubin and AST two months after the surgery. This is to illustrate how the Kasai procedure is done. So this is the absent bile duct or the drainage into the second part of duodenum. So you're basically transecting the intestine here, connecting the proximal end of the intestine into the portal, uh, porta hepatis area, hoping that the bile ducts which are atritic start draining into it. And the duodenum is anastomote side, side on to this portion of the intestine. So that's why it's called a Rau and Y porto entrostomy. So to facilitate the early diagnosis in Taiwan, a stool color card system led to a decline of late referral. And uh, this is one reason why it's regarded as simple and promising screening approach. And consider adding direct bilirubin in the initial part, as we said. And in a large series, which examined 743 infants with biliary atresia, this is the uh, survival rate. So we see that it progressively drops and still even with a reasonably successful procedure, you still need liver transplant. Of course, the success of the liver transplant and the ease of doing the procedure becomes better as a child survives longer. Survival rates with native liver decreased at the age of surgery increased from 45 days to 90 days and early diagnosis and treatment is key. So this is the stool card test. I would suggest that all of you keep a copy of it in your clinic and also discuss with the family. So any pale colored stool is abnormal and you have different consistencies and textures of normal stool. So we discussed this already that you can diagnose by looking at the conjugated jaundice in the early newborn period. So they looked at it both retrospectively, in which case all the 34 babies with biliary atresia had raised conjugated bilirubin. And uh, prospective evaluation of more than 11,000 newborns, they found uh, four cases with cholestasis. Quickly moving on to the other differentials. So polydocal cysts account for two to 3% of infants and they are surgically treatable. There are five anatomic variants of which type one uh, with 50 to 80% of the biliary cysts. And uh, this is more common in Japan for some reason, but in the rest of the world, it's one in 15,000 of the live births. Four uh, is to one more common in females and uh, abnormal pancreato biliary junction is often seen. You should not confuse the cystic type, which is 5% of the biliary atresia cases with the polydocal cyst. Of course, the pathology is different and the liver is normal here while the liver architecture is abnormal. So the liver biopsy would help you if you have a doubt. You might have heard of Caroli's disease. It's associated with the multifocal dilatation of the medium and large intrahepatic bile duct, but the common bile duct is not affected. So ultrasound will show dilatation in the liver itself, but not the bile duct. And usually it may be limited to one lobe, mostly the left lobe. And the Caroli syndrome is Caroli's disease associated with celiopathies. And you may have abnormality with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, juvenile nephronosthesis, Joubert syndrome, and so on. You can diagnose by ultrasound, ERCP or MRCP. And this uh, responds to arsodeoxypolic acid. And the final treatment is curative by liver transplantation. We quickly mentioned about TPN associated cholestasis earlier, and it's a common cause of cholestasis in preterm babies or babies with short gut who need TPN longer than two weeks. Infection could add to this, and the TPN components, both amino acid and lipid preparations, could contribute. There are recent studies which show SMOF, which is a combination of soy, MCT oil, olive oil, and fish oil, to reduce the risk of. Uh, cholestasis in babies who need long-term TPN, but it's not a major benefit, but it could help. 
CMA infection might be an additional factor in the extreme premature babies. And in most babies, this improves in a few weeks. So just monitoring and seeing the trend is adequate. And remember that uh, the uh, pathology, the liver biopsy findings overlaps with biliary atresia, so it can be confusing. Because biliary atresia can happen in premature babies as well, the approach is not different. So if a premature baby has persisting jaundice and you are worried, we should approach it the same way as in a term baby. Don't let this conflict your opinion. So this is the picture, as I said, it overlaps a lot. The portal triad, triad is preserved, the sinusoidal pattern is preserved. And you often get inflammatory infiltrates coming up. So idiopathic neonatal giant cell hepatitis is a non-specific term and it's a differential diagnosis of exclusion after you have ruled out the other causes. And the histologic findings are non-specific. Syncytial multinucleated hepatic giant cells are seen. Variable level of inflammation with infiltration of lymphocytes, neutrophils, and lobular cholestasis. It can be seen in other conditions like PFIC and alpha 1 and trypsin. So these are the different conditions where you can get giant cell hepatitis. So it can be idiopathic in 30% of the cases. Infections can contribute and biliary atresia in 20 to 30 percent of the cases. You can have metabolic conditions, alpha 1 antitrypsin, neem and pick, bile acid synthesis disorder, progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis or PFIC, and uh, endocrine disorders, chromosomal and immune conditions. Allegal syndrome accounts for 2 to 6 percent of infants with neonatal cholestasis. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen. I've just seen a couple of babies with allegal syndrome, and as I said, the neonatal. Uh, phases is not very clear. The liver histology intrahepatic paucity of bile ducts is seen and bile ductular proliferation is absent here. Mutations in the JAG1 gene are responsible for 90%. So you have a genetic diagnosis and you may also have NOTCH2 receptor mutation in another 10%. So you have broad forehead, deep set eyes, a pointed chin. So the face is triangular. We have the ocular embryo taxon, cardiac anomalies, butterfly vertebra and facial appearance may only manifest by six months. The minor criteria are growth delay, developmental delay, renal cysts, renal artery stenosis, pancreatic insufficiency. There is a risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and so you would screen them with alpha phytoprotein and ultrasound every six months. So once you have Allegil syndrome diagnosed, this is similar to beckwith vidaman syndrome where we do the screening for uh, Wilms tumor. So here we screen for hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a typical triangular phase, the deep set eyes and the chin, which is pointed. Another child, uh, you have the butterfly vertebra, so you can see the fusion in the middle. So how oh, it is appearing here. The posterior embryo toxone is an anteriorly displaced Schwalbe ring. And I have not seen this myself clinically. We have to differentiate uh, cholestasis from bilirubin uh, excretion disorders, so the non-cholestatic entities. So we have Dubin-Johnson syndrome, where the biliary excretion of conjugated bilirubin is impaired, and Rotor syndrome, where the storage of conjugated bilirubin is impaired and the bilirubin leaks into the blood. So both these are causes of conjugated bilirubin rise, but that is not cholestasis. So the rest of the enzymes and GGT and everything will be normal. You can differentiate by urinary coprocorphyrin analysis. We have the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis as a group of contributing to about 10% of the conditions. As I said earlier, these are newly diagnosed entities. There is alteration in the hepatocellular bile acid transport system. We discussed in the initial couple of slides about the canalicular system, how the bile acid transport from the hepatocyte to the canalicular will happen. So it is autosomal recessive disorders. We have three main types. The PFIC 1 and 2 appear in the first months of life and PFIC 3 later on. And there is also a difference that PFIC 1 and 2 typically have a low gamma GT compared to the other causes of cholestasis. So this is a key differentiating factor. And that's why we add the gamma GT in the investigation of these children with cholestasis, because if the GGT is low, it's not the typical obstructive cholestasis. You start looking into the genetic panel for PFIC or the bile acid secretion disorders. In the PFIC type 3, the uh, GGT is normal. And the diagnosis is based on specific immunostaining as well as by genetic panel testing. You can use arsodeoxycholic acid as a cholinetic agent to postpone bile cirrhosis. An early partial external biliary diversion may normalize serum bile acid because pruritus is a very common manifestation in these babies. And by performing this procedure, you may delay the worsening and also reduce the pruritus. 
liver transplantation will be needed in these babies as well. And we have metabolic disorders, 5% of the neonatal cholestasis. So cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a PA, is a desired phenotype. It can present with early onset progressive liver failure and transplantation is needed. Of course, the other types may present with emphysema. So the liver disorder is seen in PA is a desired phenotype. We have uh, Gaucher's disease, Neiman pig type C, uh, and tyrosinemia type 1, galactosemia, hereditary fructose intolerance, as we discussed earlier. And lastly, the low uh, GGT conditions include uh, bile acid disorders. So abnormal bile acids will be so bile acid synthetic disorders where abnormal bile acids are seen in the urine. Diagnosis is by mass spectrometry, and they can be treated by primary bile acid replacement. So Chinodeoxycholic acid replacement might help in these conditions. So this is another useful uh, reference which uh, you can review and it gives a good uh, explanation of the PFIC and other conditions as well. Just to finish up by again the flow chart, I mean, we have prolonged jaundice with direct hyperbilirubinemia. You look at the stool color, if the stool color is pale, your urgency is much more. But of course, this doesn't rule out, you still have to watch them. and. Uh, Basal lab chemistry fasting is done and ultrasonography fasting is done. And you look at these conditions. Uh, you go on to go liver biopsy, scintigraphy or ERCP is not often done. If liver biopsy is suggestive, you go for intraoperative cholangiography and possibly Kasai. And if uh, the stool color is normal, you go for basal, basal lab chemistry and ultrasonography. And you have to consider more of the non-obstructive conditions, but you cannot rule out obstruction. You may still need to do liver biopsy to exclude. In terms of management, we have vitamin K and multivitamins with higher dose of the fat-soluble vitamin because the fat absorption is deranged. You need high calorie intake as well as use of MCT to bypass the uh, lack of bile because MCT doesn't need bile for absorption. Arso deoxycholic acid helps in ameliorating the cholestasis, improves the bile flow. By improving the bile flow, it can also displace the toxic bile acids from hepatocytes, reduce the bile acid-related prorators in some of these babies. Uh, in older infants, rifampicin can be used to treat the prorators, though the mechanism is unknown. It's also possibly an enzyme stimulator in the liver and like phenobarbitone can be considered to use. Antihistamines are not very useful. And if medical treatment fails and prurators is very severe, you may do a partial biliary diversion. So biliary drainage through a stoma or a partial ileal bypass the uh, bile duct taken into the ileal area. It can reduce the cholestatic pruritus and there is treatment specific for the etiology which will depend on whether it's a urinary tract infection, galactosemia, metabolic conditions, and of course, uh, Kasai for biliary atresia. For the PFIC conditions, unfortunately, no specific treatment. It's only the UDCA, biliary diversion, and wait for liver transplant. So to conclude, it's very important not to miss conjugated jaundice. A sensible approach to investigations and management is important. Don't hesitate to involve the appropriate experts. Remember that there is a medical legal indication uh, implication if you don't pick up the diagnosis on time. So always have in your system a good way to get the, I mean, the newborn screening results. Have a system to review these babies around two to three weeks. So you screen them. Most of the time I do the transcutaneous bilirubin. If it is above 50, I tend to do the blood test for prolonged on the screen. And once you do the direct bilirubin and it is normal, and if they are breastfeeding, you just support them and don't worry about it. If it is borderline, you may repeat it and then proceed with the investigations as well. So now we will have some discussions. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for a very uh, nice uh, presentation. So we are starting uh, our questions and answer session. Uh, so here is a three questions. Uh, number one is, is there any role of uh, phenobarbitone in case of conjugate hyperbilirubinemia? Phenobarbitone induces the liver enzymes and it also acts like partial cholinetic agent. So, I mean, as I said, the only indication we used to use is to stimulate the secretion uh, before you do the HIDA scan. For the treatment, there is no real role. And don't delay the diagnosis of important conditions. 
Even for the pruritus, phenobarbitone has been studied and arsodeoxycholic acid is much more effective than phenobarbitone. And of course, you all know about the side effects of phenobarbitone. So it's not recommended as a treatment. Of course, if you don't have any options like rifampicin and UDC alone doesn't help, you can't do the biliary diversion, then you can consider phenobarb to reduce the pruritus, but the effect is less. And uh, as I said, the HIDAS scan is not recommended that much these days. You go direct for the liver biopsy. Right, sir. So, second question is uh, uh, why color of stool is a colic in case of uh, conjugated hepatobilirubinemia? Why not in unconjugated uh, case? What is the initial part again? Sir, why color of stool is a colic? Why stool color is changed? And... I explained that uh, conjugated bilirubin doesn't enter the blood normally. So, conjugated bilirubin comes from the canaliculus. Uh, into the bile duct and directly coming into the stool. And if the bilirubin has to enter from the stool into the blood, it is after the beta glucuronidase breaks down the conjugation. Right. Conjugated bilirubin only enters into the bloodstream if the hepatocyte is damaged or there is an obstruction. So, uh, unconjugated bilirubin doesn't cause, uh, I mean, the color of the stool comes from the bilirubin and the lack of. Uh, uh, the bilirubin coming into the stool from the obstruction is the reason for the echoing stools. Same for the urine, I mean, because urine, the blood doesn't have conjugated bilirubin and there is no uh, conjugated bilirubin in the urine for the same reason because the kidney cannot filter what is not there. But if there is obstructive jaundice, you get bilirubin, conjugated bilirubin in the blood and the urine may get it as well. So, color of the urine being yellow, deep yellow with stains and nappy and lack of bilirubin in the stool. That is a sign that the bile is not coming into the intestine. Right, sir. So third question is, is it necessary uh, uh, acolytic stool in case of the biliary atresia? Acolytic stool in case of biliary atresia? I mean, as I said, we should have a high index of suspicion. And if there is acolytic stool, it points to an obstructive etiology more often. But other causes of intrahepatic positive or allegal syndrome may be associated as well. So it doesn't, uh, it's not very specific. And many cases of neonatal hepatitis may have pale stool in the beginning as well, and it improves with time. But in biliary atresia as well, it may be a delayed sign. So it doesn't need to be depending on the severity of the obstruction. Is it's a progressive condition? So an absence doesn't rule it out. If you have conjugated bilirubin, you start working up and the ultrasound, for example, might guide you. And then you go for liver biopsy to differentiate if you don't have any other option. So most of the babies with biliary atresia will have pale stools as the time progresses. All right, sir. So another question is uh, from uh, Dr. Hanifullah. For how much time uh, we will give uh, also deoxycholic acid? So it depends on what you're treating. I mean, if it's a TPN related cholestasis, for example, I mean, we give it till the direct bilirubin becomes uh, less than two or something and the baby is not otherwise symptomatic. You see a progressive improving trend. If you are treating a long-term condition like the PFIC or uh, the bile acid synthetic disorders, you would need to continue it long-term. So Carolis disease also responds to UDCA and in bile acid synthetic disorders, uh, I'm not sure what products are available, but if you give the specific uh, chenodeoxycholic acid or cholic acid, it responds better. So we have different options, but the duration will depend on the condition you're treating. So the biliary atresia, obviously, once the baby has a surgery, you would not continue it. We are talking of idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. You continue it till the child has a conjugated bilirubin staying high. Right, sir. Uh, so second question is from Dr. Aladdin Malik. He's asking, uh, in primary, progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis, uh, when enzyme normalize and can we stop uh, also, urodeoxycholic acid. No, unfortunately, these are uh, potentially fatal conditions unless you do liver transplant. So it's not a reversible condition. Okay, right, sir. So the second question is from Dr. Naila. Uh, she's asking how how do you treat breastfeeding jaundice? I explained that in the beginning, and uh, basically, breast milk jaundice and breastfeeding jaundice are different. Breastfeeding jaundice is where you just support the feeding of the baby. You make sure the lactation support is there. And breast milk jaundice is where after two weeks, the jaundice persists at a high level. And this is due to the beta glucuronidase in the breast milk. Here also, you have to reassure the mother. And uh, I'll share the link to my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, I mean, this information is there in the Zoom chat. I don't know if 
everyone can access the Zoom chat. So there are specific videos, as uh, Dr. Saeed mentioned at the beginning, including the breast milk jaundice and breastfeeding, and most of these topics are covered as well. Right, sir. Uh, so I think questions uh, right now. Your hand so I don't have there. access to the uh, chat or I mean, I'm seeing the question and answer. Let me see. So Dr. Khalid Hak bhi hain pe, Dr. Khalid and Dr. Sajad bhi hain. If agar ke wo kuch kehna chahe. Sir, can you hear us? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, I thank you, Sajad. It is a very, very good presentation. Thank you for a very complex subject and uh, you covered it beautifully. I am very grateful. I learned quite a lot today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear. Yeah, I wanted to say the same thing, uh, Dr. Sridhar. This is Dr. Sajjad speaking. Thank you very yeah. much for this uh, extensive review of a subject which is a little bit poorly understood. <laughs> but we learned a lot. We really appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure having both of you listening as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vikram, sir, you can say anything, sir? Uh, uh, but yes, I want to pay thanks to Dr. Sridhar. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank and, you, Dr. Vikram. Nice to see you in person. I mean, we meet on the Facebook. <laughs> yes. Uh, and we, sorry, uh, you, we will, inshallah, arrange for the sessions and uh, improve our more discussion and collaboration. Uh, Thank you. For you are doing a great job. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, another question from uh, Dr. Aladdin Malik. Uh, so he's asking, uh, what is prognosis of autoimmune neonatal hepatitis? I mean, uh, unfortunately, I don't have much experience. So Dr. Dr. Khalid, do you have any comments, sir, Dr. Sajjad? The prognosis is actually not very good, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, even and certainly medium term prognosis and long term is bad even short term it's sometimes very very difficult to treat sometimes you use steroids in that isn't it i don't yes, know yes it doesn't really i mean <laughs> steroid is somebody we always use as a last measure if nothing we don't know anything we add steroid but it actually doesn't work that much yes right sir so i think uh, questions are completed uh, if anybody wants to ask uh, any questions? So, most welcome. I just want to say thank you again. Thank you again. Very thank you very much. I really enjoyed your lecture last week, and of course, Dr. Sajjad often visits us in UAE, and uh, I had the fortune to meet him many times. Thank you, Dr.